Okay, thank you. And this month, once again, we are very happy to have Thomas Wisniewski back with us. Thomas and I go way back. Then he's an investor from way back. So Thomas, tell, oh, do you want to go around the room first? Although I don't know who all these Bonnie helpers are. Please, if you change, <laughs> put, put your proper names in. Why don't, why don't I talk for a little bit? Okay. And then kind of go around the, around the horn, as you said, give everyone an opportunity to kind of say who they are and what they're working on. Um, I would say maybe as a starting point for that, why doesn't everyone, certainly, yeah, everyone is here, certain, most definitely the founders, use the chat to just put in, you know, the name of your company, uh, you know, your name and a sentence or two about kind of uh, what it is. That way we'll have kind of a written record too. And then we'll also okay. give some people to go around. I find it useful to have it in the chat. Okay. So uh, a little background on myself um, and then a little background on the kind of things that uh, currently investing in and the current fund that I'm a part of. Uh, so uh, I'm a lifelong New Yorker, um, been living here forever, born here, been a lot of different places, but kind of always had my base of operations here. Uh, I'd done a lot of different things prior to venture capital. Um, I was a part of a, a startup that was a management consulting firm uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so did, did was around during dot-com one and helping companies get launched and sort out that sort of thing. They gave me my first taste for the intersection of tech, web, and business. Uh, and post the crash, uh, I uh, and the, and the, my firm got sold at the height of the uh, dot com boom. Produced a great exit. Um, and uh, after that, I worked. Uh, in and around venture capital is kind of an operating guy. So my background is as someone who gets into businesses to understand what's going on, you know, utilizing kind of a consulting approach, right? In the sense of understanding how companies function and why they're differentiated and you know, how they work. And that's my way of understanding things, um, you know, uh, as I get into that and I apply that to um, the portfolio of venture companies post uh, the crash to see whether any of them are worth saving, uh, help people help uh, uh, VCs with new investments. Uh, and I really liked the company, I would put some of my own money into it or sweat equity, or if I really, really liked it, I would join the team and help lead a turnaround or an expansion or that sort of thing. So a bunch of direct operating experiences. Uh, I was CEO of a sassy learning company. I was a, a part of the management group of a call center collections company. Someone's got uh, some noise in the background. Maybe uh, maybe go to mute. Uh, and I started angel investing because uh, I kind of missed the early stage world that I had been uh, more uh, involved with uh, during the kind of first dot-com boom. And I uh, joined New York Angels, you may be aware of. Uh, and that proved very fruitful for me to get associated with a lot of other angels and kind of learn that from a more direct standpoint. So uh, during that period, um, I invested in 30 different uh, ventures, um, mostly B2B, uh, mostly New York based or East Coast based, but there were some outside of that. And in addition, I invested into uh, a, a number of venture funds as a way to kind of diversify, but also as a way to back um, new funds and people I had been working with as they were starting those. Uh, and it helps build network in a sense if you're kind of doing that. I had the opportunity and the, and the wherewithal. And that was all done uh, out of Rose Paul Investments to Bonnie's question earlier. That's the family office vehicle that my uh, wife and I put together. She's also an entrepreneur, um, built a company uh, in the hedge fund world, hedge fund servicing world, and sold it. Um, and it's a result of those windfalls that allow us to have a, uh, that kind of a vehicle and allowed me to invest uh, a few million dollars in, uh, in startups and funds. Um, those uh, did quite well. Um, it takes a long time in seed, right? My first big exit took about six and a half, seven years. Um, so from 27 to uh, or 2007, what was that? 07 to uh, 14, 
Um, and along the way, there certainly have been more. Uh, and then maybe just to, to kind of quickly wrap it up, um, on my background at least, about five years ago, I was introduced to the founder of Audible, the audiobook company. Many of you probably know about Audible. They're uh, part of Amazon. Um, really interesting company, incredible dynamic founder uh, by the name of Don Katz. Uh, you may not know, but Audible was a dot-com 1.0 company. It was public during the crash. It was one of a very small number that's, that you know, lived through that. Uh, after that, they had multiple near-death experiences trying to get off the ground this idea of spoken word and audiobooks. You know, it seems so no normal now, but it was, uh, it was very difficult to get that out there. And as the iPhone and smart uh, uh, smartphone began to become obsequious, in particular the iPhone platform, everyone had it. Suddenly we all had a, a device that made this very easy and their, and their business just exploded. Um, relevant to the starting of, of Nordic Venture Partners, uh, Don uh, is a very progressive guy, uh, really believes in, in doing good while doing well. Uh, it's not about giving money to charities, it's about positioning your company and what you do directly as a way to kind of provide uh, give back. In particular, he's focused on urban revitalization um, and he had done a bunch of things in Newark already. So when he had the opportunity, he moved the 100 person audible company from the suburbs to downtown Newark. People thought he was crazy, but um, you know, he, he was able to, to see the, you know, the beginnings of, a, of this a renaissance there. And this is in the, the late, you know, kind of pre 2010. And uh, uh, they've thrived here, sort of proven in a sense that you could hire some of the most difficult tech and media people and get them to come here and be able to thrive and build this great culture and company. By the time I met him, uh, they were maybe at 700 people, you know, started at 100. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, there were several thousand here now. Um, and if you simplify that the vision he had is that, you know, we as a company are having this very positive impact. We are, you know, they are the fastest growing company, certainly in the area, certainly one of the fastest growing companies probably in New Jersey altogether. And if we had more fast growing tech companies here, there is such, amount, there's such an economic impact of having those businesses and people who uh, have these jobs, and spend money and live and whatever in, in an area, it, it's just natural market driven economic development, which uh, if you look around, it proved very effective. So the thought was simply, if we had 10 more audibles in Newark, we would um, you know, be a very different place. How do we do that? Venture capital is definitely a part of that. Um, there's other things that need to be formed. We want to create a tech ecosystem here. And as an extension, really, of the New York um, ecosystem, we're not trying to be separate. Uh, and uh, But to do it well, um, you know, I kind of took this amorphous idea and boiled it down to something I thought could work and would be competitive and function within the, the VC community, and that's Newark Venture Partners. So the initial fund was a, uh, a $45 million fund. The LPs, major LPs, were corporations and, and high net worth individuals and family offices that all had some association in the area. Uh, we are full on venture capital. We invest in anything we would like. We're not beholden to the corporations, although we leverage them and their access to them. Uh, we don't just invest. We don't just invest in New Jersey companies. Um, you don't have to come to Newark to take our money, but we uh, are confident um, and have a track record of uh, uh, attracting um, a portion of those companies we invest in to come to our space and live, and then lay down roots in Newark and, and toward that goal of generating the next, you know, kind of ten audibles. In particular, we focus on B2B software. So we don't do device or things that are too consumer of any kind. Um, you know, we don't do kind of physical infrastructure things, uh, you know, or bio or whatever. Within, within B2B software based, we've got a couple of uh, themes that we're mining and then we are opportunistic. So about one third or 20% to 25% in uh, health tech we've done. A similar uh, size in I'll call supply chain and industrial tech, but again in software, and then sort of slices of fintech and audio and others. And then we're also opportunistic personally 
I, I've done a bunch of investing across a model, uh, a model that kind of goes across a lot of those, and that's in the marketplace, sort of B2B marketplace model, um, or maybe more generally e-commerce tools and platforms for B2B. You know, and the belief there is that B2B is this huge trillion dollar industry that dwarfs uh, consumer. It's all paper and forms and stuff. It will come online. It will be digitized. It's beginning to, there are great, there are going to be great investment opportunities across that. And marketplace models are, will be one of them that, uh, and there's a lot of advantages. So that's, that's kind of what I've been, uh, uh, been uh, focused on. But I'm going to pause there. There's, there's more things I can talk about, about what we do as a firm, but maybe I'll leave it there. So Bonnie, do we want to go around now? Just uh, get people to- um, Yes, I, I just saw that I was muted. I you want to call on them, or I could, uh, Abby. Oh, I, we always had at least two, but two, uh, not two Abbies. Abby uh, Ludovice. Sorry. Hi there. And sorry about that, Bonnie. I was one of the ones that was listed as Bonnie Helper, and I don't even know yeah. why. Um, I, I used your link. Maybe it depends. If maybe there's something yeah, about sorry, the that. that was introducing people as you so, for this time. So apologize for that. Um, uh, I'm Abby Ludovice. I am... Uh, working on a, um, a luxury home hygiene product. It's a cleaning brand that uh, sort of judges the space to make it a more luxurious experience. Um, we have a hybrid DTC uh, model, which uh, combines some specialty retail and in real life experiences um, with, a, um, with other DTC uh, sort of launch strategies. Oh, nice oh thank you. Me. I hate to say this, other Abby, I know it's Abby Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Bonnie. Um, thanks for being here, Tom. It's great to see everybody. Um, my name is Abby Sugar, and I am the founder and CEO of Play Out Apparel. 56% of Gen Z shops outside of their assigned gender, and at Play Out, we're leading the new gender equal shopping ecosystem. So we don't have men's or women's sections. Um, and Bonnie, you told me last time, I didn't tell you um, when we were in the New York Times, but yeah, Yesterday, I was featured in the Forbes Next 1000. So oh, I'll send you a little link. You. Yeah, please do. So thanks so much. And good on you. Adrian. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, where are you? I oh, see so you're in New York. Be back in yeah, I'm in New York. I'm uh, at Domino Park. I thought I'd have my coffee and listen to you guys as I walk around. Um, but always nice to be on this call. Um, I'm the co-founder of Reveal. We're uh, building a platform to automate the paperwork for creators. Our thesis is that uh, creators are the new sort of wave of small and medium businesses and need tools to, uh, to run their, their admin. Uh, so we're doing that. We recently um, opened up our, our beta platform and have uh, over 300 users now. So we're pretty excited about the, the growth that we're seeing and uh, gearing up to uh, raise a pre-seed. Thank you. Claire Chen, who's here twice. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, this is Claire, Claire Chen. Uh, there are a lot of life in Taipei and San Francisco Bay Area. And we are the financial, uh, Puti Financial uh, Advisory and Investment Management Consultancy Fund. Currently, we are uh, raising two uh, early stage funds for uh, the early stage startups. Uh, one is at the biotech medical device with a breakthrough technology and they do have uh, patents and TFDA approved and now US FDA pending. So anyone if you're interested, I would love to uh, do the follow up email. The other one would be agriculture systematics. That one would be uh, in Europe. So, and we are also uh, managing this uh, pre IPO private shares to the uh, highly network individuals. So Claire, you're an investor. I was already oh, you in Mr. Uh, like Joe as uh, 10 years ago or seven, eight years ago. But now we are just managing uh, some of the investment project at the moment. And we also helping uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, startup company, but all built around the technology. But our space is more focused on uh, impact investment, um, biotech, biopharma, healthcare tech, aging tech, longevity tech, and the uh, sustainable real estate development right now. Uh, the what we have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl. 
Hey, good morning, guys. How are hey. you? I'm actually getting my morning ride in, so I wouldn't be outside bad on the knees for me. <laughs> so I am the founder and CEO of a company, a cannabis lifestyle company by the name of, oh, did I lose you guys? My phone was coming in. I'm sorry about that. Uh, by the name of Buddy Love, uh, located here in Chicago. So we are basically advocates for CBD and cannabis, showing the plant there's a different way of life behind the healthiness of eradicating all the opioids that people can take and saying that cannabis and CBD is a better way. So we're focused on that in the early stages of this company. I thought cannabis was a gateway drug. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> James, <laughs> you can't fool me down. James. Oh, you're muted. James Byrne? Otherwise, we're going to go on to June Choi. I know she's not shy. Hello. <laughs> I'm the um, founding managing partner of Serval Ventures, and we're an emerging tech in, uh, infrastructure venture builder and investor focused on very early stage. And um, currently, I'm working with Bonnie on launching, uh, we've launched a health tech um, data company um, that will revolutionize healthcare and, um, uh, and will exit at a million plus, a billion plus valuation in five, six years. And then I am working with Bonnie and Tripp um, on uh, accelerating uh, startups from Korea for the Korean government in the US among uh, among other things and looking at other companies, of course, so. Thank you. Uh, Lionel. Hello, yes, uh, Lionel here. I um, uh, run a uh, growth marketing agency, um, Inflect Digital. Uh, my background is uh, a Facebook account manager for a couple of years uh, consulting uh, businesses on their marketing strategy using social media. So left Facebook to uh, start my own agency and I've uh, been working with uh, specifically uh, diverse uh, tech startups um, and focused on um, uh, driving growth and profitability for my clients. Thank you. Well, I'm on Eve. Hello, good morning, Bonnie and everyone uh, i'm glad to be here i'm munif i'm the co-founder of integra pitch uh, we are providing virtual runways for revolutionary uh, inventions to allow them to grow support get uh, development through alignment of incentive and also facilitating early access for investments and uh, crowdsourcing glad to be here no oh, thank you Oh, who did I? Oh, Robin. Robin, I have to introduce you to June, too. I oh, we have to chat again. Oh, Robin? I know she was here. I guess she'll be back. I think she's there, but I don't think we can hear her. Oh, Robin, are you muted? And I know she's not shy because I know Robin. We can't hear you, Robin. She's not muted, but her audio is not working. Oh, your audio is not working. Oh, you want to try coming? You want to try coming back into the room and happy? I will introduce you. Don't worry, Robin. Oh, oh we'll come back to you when we've resolved that. Uh, Ronald. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Ron DiRienzi. I am uh, the founder of a company called Results First. I'm a career management consultant focused on operational improvement and change management. I most recently worked in the uh, biotech and pharmaceutical industry, helping to launch and manage teams to launch uh, about five brands and also manage about seven alliances in uh, some big pharma. And actually took a role with one of my clients for a few years. But uh, it was fun listening to Tom's introduction. I spent uh, time helping to run the electronic commerce practice at KPMG Consulting uh, before it became Bearing Point. And it, you reminded me of a lot of things that we talked about 20 years ago that uh, 
have really come to pass in the last you know decade or so. So it's great to hear your story. Thanks. So Robin, I know you're muted right now, but uh, are you able to oh, introduce yourself? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, my name is Robin Leary. And um, I am a scientist by training, a molecular biologist, did a postdoc in chemistry and a second one in drug development. Um, I have worked in biotech drug development for about seven plus years now. And I am interested in raising my own venture fund um, to work in the life sciences area. Um, I'm also pretty big into real estate. Um, like lately I've been in Baja trying to um, find some good properties, beachfront, no luck yet, but I've made a couple of attempts, put a couple of bids in. Um, yeah, and I work as a global medical science director for Ascented Pharma, a Chinese-based biotech company with a U.S. presence, and I work on everything ex-China. I've scaled back. I'm trying it as a consultant, and it's not working. So I want to someday quit my day job and become a real VC. Nice to meet you all. So right now, she's, she's part of the uh, Tech Coast Angels as well. Yes. Scott. But I'm happy Morning. to talk uh, to Scott Purdy. Oh, oh. Uh, oh. Did you oh, call Thomas Scott or no? Oh, Thomas said something. I, mean, I said, Robin, I'm happy to uh, give you whatever pearls of wisdom as someone who, who went from somewhere else to BC and uh, try and talk you out of doing it. Oh, <laughs> well, I would love to chat further. I'll introduce you, or maybe Thomas wants to include his email address in the in the chat. So Scott, sorry we, introdu nope. we interrupted. Nope, that's fine. I'm Scott Purdy. <clears throat> I'm a company called Sine, based in the Philadelphia region, but uh, I'm right down the road from Tom. I'm at exit three, <laughs> so a little short drive in New Jersey. Um, our company is uh, building a movie making product that allows the multi-source inputs into the movie making and through the use of AI, we'll develop a professional quality movie in a very short amount of time. Um, this last year, we've made quite a bit of headway. We're working with a company called Brit, Brick Simple out of the um, Pennsylvania area. I don't know if anybody knows that Anson who runs it, but they've done a lot of help with us. We expect to be uh, really releasing the product to the public by uh, January. Thank you. And Trip. Good morning, Bonnie. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Trip Braden. I do a lot of work specifically with diversity entrepreneurs around the area of early stage partnerships and critical partnerships, as well as helping them to develop their market client markets. So I help them go in and make a lot of introductions to corporate people, help them get the distribution channels in place, and ultimately help them close business together. So that's my specialty. And I'm, I also co-host with Bonnie on Clubhouse every Wednesday at nine o'clock. So if you're looking for more of Bonnie, and a lot of different investors. It's a great time, as well as her newsletter, which you can get a lot of great resources from. So thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, I'll put the link in the chat. So questions, there are always questions. Anybody have a question for Tom? I'll be oh, what is this, right? Go ahead, Abby. Well, I just wanted to jump in a little bit of what you said you were interested in in the e-commerce space and the marketplaces space. Um, and I know that when you talk about marketplaces, you know, we can talk about everything from marketplaces that are listing B2B companies, as well as direct to consumer marketplaces for consumers, right, um, of physical products, whether it be apparel or something else. Um, but from the company or founder brand perspective, because there's so much noise these days on the internet, advertising is so expensive, it's hard to get eyeballs. How do you see marketplaces really being able to reach their own customers because they are a, a B2C in some way as well? So how, how do, do e-commerce brands do or how do new marketplaces? New marketplaces. New marketplaces. So just to clarify, you mean like if, if someone here was trying to launch a marketplace for beauty products or for you know, a larger group of people doing. Yeah, you know, so it, it can be easy to get your one-sided marketplace with your brands to come on and want to be involved and want to list. But then as a marketplace, yes, the brands are be bringing their customers, but I also want the marketplace to, to be discoverable, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I risk of you know, uh, droning on for a while, right? The, what is the marketplace model? What, why do people do it? 
right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it, it's a, you know, and how is it different than say other kinds of things? Well, it's a two-sided model generally where you have a bunch of suppliers on you know, one side, a bunch of you know, consumers demand on the other side. They can be of different constituencies. I think it's, it's primary examples where there's kind of both on both sides, right? They can work otherwise, but you think of an Amazon, right? Or a Etsy or, or a bunch of other ones. And it's also things like, you know, um, you know, 99 designs, right? Where the commodity there is a service, design service. But again, there's suppliers on one side, demand on the other. They transact here. Probably the most well-developed model to think about are financial markets. I want to buy some stock. You want to sell it. We get into the middle, right? Um, and we do a transaction. The value of that on a high level is, uh, you know, a number of things. But I think most importantly, is it's the aggregation of demand and the aggregation of supply in one place, right? So if I go to some place as someone who's demanding something, wants something, I don't have to search all over the place. I have all these, you know, suppliers and if it's set up correctly, I can, you know, I can search across it. I can do discovery across all these different suppliers rather than having to go somewhere else. Again, done well, I can, there's standardization of features and, and pricing, and that sort of thing, so I can make those appropriate kind of connections. And then it facilitates a, a transaction payments, right? To me, it's not a marketplace unless you can, you're able to go through the whole process and actually buy something, right? Um, another way to look at it is often in, you know, in prior markets, there was uh, a middleman in many of these, right? So you think about real estate, right? Brokers of various kinds, right? And uh, I don't think brokers will ever disappear from real estate, but there's been this thought that why can't supply and demand of house sellers just get together? Um, so that's basic marketplace kind of thing. Um, uh, that said, um, one of the challenges of marketplaces is you, you basically have two customers, right? You've got to you've got to get you know make create a reason why. The, the consumer should be on the platform, curate a reason why the supplier is going for it. And then how do you just get things started, right? This idea of priming the pump. And you can't get ahead on one side, too many suppliers and they're not getting any sales, there's not enough demand or too many you know, potential consumers on the other side and not enough things to, uh, uh, to buy, right? Or it doesn't match that. So there's, there's a number of things that need to be done that are different with marketplaces that make it, you know, more challenging to get one up and running. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe I'll pause there and see if that leads leads down the, the path of your question. Yeah, exactly. And then my other sort of continuing off of that would be, you know, you're exactly right, chicken before the egg, right? A brand doesn't want to be on a marketplace if it doesn't have the cut consumers coming on and then consumers don't want it if they can't find what they want on that marketplace. It sounds like, um, because I've had certain levels of this conversation before, it's a really hot area right now, whether it's a fintech marketplace or a B2C marketplace, a, you know, a marketplace for women-owned brands, right? For example, just because I'm familiar with that, right? But there's like, all of a sudden this year, 15 marketplaces for women-owned brands. So how does a new marketplace compete um, and reach both customers and consumers to, to be that value add that you were just talking about. Okay, so I, so now I think I understand your question a little bit better. Um, well, I mean, look, you're you're competing for eyeballs and attention, right? Um, I would say, like anything, right? You got to be differentiated relative to what the other alternatives are. Um, there are a number of ways you can do that, right? And it also, if you do it right, solves another problem, which is you can't be all things to all people at the beginning. So even if you're, even if your goal is to be, you know, men's and women's apparel, right? There are a lot of reasons why you might want to start with just shoes or something between, because it's just really hard to do that. Um, this idea of entry point strategy, right? Um, so by choosing a category or a um, constituency out there in the market, right? And focusing in on them and trying to drive value there, that can create a starting point where you're successful, right? And, and, and differentiated relative to the competition and therefore can kind of 
you know, attract proto supply and proto demand and, um, and uh, uh, get things going. Other things that are important is uh, what I would call is sort of reducing friction, right? Um, of adapting a new product and getting to a sale kind of a thing. Re really big, really big deal. Uh, you know, we all kind of know in the back of our head, but um, anything you can do to shorten the sign up process, to put as, you know, as few things in between someone hearing about you, signing up and getting some value. Now that value could be something pre the transaction. In fact, often it needs to be, meaning I get on there and I immediately get value out of being able to see a bunch of different products I've never seen before and um, to understand those, those brands. So I've immediately got some, you know, some reason to come back. Uh, and you know, if you can shorten that on both sides and make it a good experience, other ways, um, sometimes that marketplaces provide a set of tools for one side or the other that gets people using the platform for their own business, not just for this piece of the business of what they're selling, but they find this pro, this simple you know, cloud platform really useful to their home business. And yeah, it also allows their, to access this marketplace, but that's sort of like the quid pro quo. I'll give you this, right? It's free right? and it's gonna help you organize your inventory and you know, run a little system for you. So by adding that value ahead of time, right again, gets people, gets the pump prime pumped. Uh, so these are just sort of best practices along the line of how do you differentiate? Yeah. How do you just get noticed in a crowd? Bottom line is differentiation in every example that you get. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing. And then just get noticed because you could be clearly differentiated, right? But the noisier the market and part of what you said there, the more challenge it is to try and do something. So one of the things as an investor I'm reluctant to do is to back companies that are in noisy markets. Um, not that I won't do it, but the bar just is high. The bar keeps going higher the more noise that's out there. You know, one way to, one way to see that is like how many people are bidding on the top three slots for some search, right? That you would really like to have. And even if they're not as good, they're going to say they do the same thing or whatever, and it's just going to confuse things. So unless you have some some way to partner with someone and get to customers in a different way, it's just very challenging, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm just aware of how marketplace tends is sort of like a buzzword. What are you building? Everyone's building marketplaces these days, honestly. And I think that if you look at per category, right? So like how many marketplaces are there really for apps, for example, right? Or how many marketplaces are there really for shoe, women's shoes only, right? Then you can look at who yeah. you're actually competing against, right? Let's, so let's do this. Let's put a pin in it. Happy to talk marketplaces all day, uh, all along. It's like one of my things. Well, why don't we move on? Who's got the Who's got the next question? Raise your hand, virtually or not. Hi, this is Claire. Claire Chen. We have one of early stage startup. Current round is on C fund round, and uh, it's based in Switzerland. And uh, strategist partner is uh, SGS. Then uh, it's it's tech agricultural systematics. Built by Sax, S A A X, e commerce B2B, B2C, and bottom up sign and act with the active 35,000 retails with China. They're going to launch the franchising the system in China and the Pakistan. So, would you be interested to take a look? Thanks. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, I'd say I'm not clear. I understand exactly what you do, right? <laughs> just, just give me the minute. Our company does what? This uh, agricultural systematics uh, technology company uh, doing this uh, e-commerce and they have a franchise system going to launch in China and the Pakistan. And, so as, a Pakistan see it and, and as a result of this, um, what does the customer get? Uh, What's the value that's delivered? The, this is the system which is the um, can feed hunger meets uh, SDGs ago and uh, can have the eyes on the all the transaction transparency within the blockchain so that uh, on top of the headquarter of the company, which is uh, will get all the percentage through this assistance. 
mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the top right characteristic. So, so did I hear you right? There's a social component for feeding people or did I get that wrong? No, no, no. It's a system. System. Okay. You know, by SARS, S -A -A -S. Yes. Yes, SAS system for doing this. Okay, so um, I'm still not sure I understand kind of clearly what you do. Right. Part of it is, you know, I, I react better kind of looking at decks and understanding them. So I would say that's would be great. Uh, I will ask the founder and CEO saying you're a deck. Yeah. Or so, a so, meeting. Are, yeah so, so I would say, look, send me a deck. I better understand it. What I would say is it's unlikely to be something I would invest in or invest in through my platform because of its international scope. Um, I invest in things that are U.S. based or at a minimum, maybe based elsewhere, but are focused on the U.S. market and we're probably moving here. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Legally, that's the other thing just to know. Um, and most U.S. investors draw kind of a bright line on is it a U.S. based company? Is right? a Swiss based company? Only a Delaware support. Right. So just to be aware, that's kind of a technicality. Um, uh, you know, our fund, as its way it's written, is we, you know, we have to get an exception in order to invest in anything that's not U.S. C Corp. So it can't be an LLC. You know, so there are those kind of technical aspects that my guess would be, based on what you described, that it wouldn't be a fit for uh, for us. But I'm happy to take a look at the deck, and I'm happy to give you some feedback on on next steps. Thank you, Thank you. Tom. More questions. Come on, guys. Speak up. Your found your founders or proto founders. If you, if you can't ask, uh, you know, can't put up your hand and and, and uh, be willing to step forward, I, uh, you're going to have to learn. Question. I have a question, Tom. Great. Uh, I was wondering what you see as the big trends in B two B software from what you're seeing because there's so much change in the last eighteen months. What are you looking for as trends longer term and what you invest in? Hmm. So I tend not to invest a lot of time in saying, you know, and saying here are the big trends, and, and you know, because I don't want to be, you know, using that in my discussions, right? Uh, the way I talk about an industry, but it's a good question, right? So, uh, you know, if I shift kind of my my uh, my framework, talk about that, I would say, you know, in B two B, let's look at the landscape, right? The landscape is relatively untouched by by software right um it's clearly can see it when you compare you know what's being done in many different b2b contexts and you know the anal the analogy in the consumer world right or just hey they're using paper and pens and maybe excel and email if they're lucky to get something done and we can clearly look at that and say wow there's room for some improvement here there are also a lot of reasons why it's not that easy to make the jump, or they would have, right? So that, that's clearly out there as part, and that creates incredible opportunity because you're going to, you can add value and that that disruption thing. And you know, disruption we've turned into this great word, which it is for us as entrepreneurs. But the point is, when existing relationships in the industry are getting disruptive, it presents an environment where us as an entrepreneur can steal share and grow quickly. That's why we like disruption, right? And it speaks to maybe our solution is the thing that's disrupting, maybe in better in some way, right? And, and it frees up customers in some sense to, to go after. So there's certainly that going around. Um, that maybe leads to my second point, which is vertical based, right? I think horizontal solutions of the past, right? And you think about, uh, I like to think about B2B and structure it sort of as a, a in a supply chain way, like you know, where's something made upstream, what's in between, you know, manufacturing certainly works this way, but most do. You know, what, what are different steps that are being sold to, you know, who's the buyer, and maybe downstream from what, what what's getting used, right? If it's that kind of thing, or if it's a service, it's just between, you know, between. Uh, past solutions to try and do this think e procurement software never really got that far. One, because they were horizontal and therefore did not um, customize enough to an individual vertical. So, for instance, I invested recently in a, in a company called Gearflow, uh, and they are a marketplace for uh, construction equipment, vehicles, the parts for this stuff, right? So, um, and there's an example of 
uh, I got to get focused enough on, you know, on a segment of the market. So it's not auto parts. It's not machinery that's this, it's this big. It is not, you know, a bunch of other things, right? But it is this set of equipment, the kind of things that are, you know, cost tens of thousands of dollars that are being used in a construction site that break. And when they break, it's down it's downtime that's that's costly. The market's fragmented, right? So here's where so the, the solution needed to be vertical enough in order to appeal to a customer, but not too small insofar as it needs to satisfy kind of all their needs. And it needs to also fit who the suppliers are in the other market. There's an example of where I think vertical super important. So I would say that's another trend of success here kind of in, in the in the e-commerce world. Uh, that's a marketplace. Um, marketplace to me is just one kind of model, one kind of uh, approach to B2B e-commerce, right? There are certainly others, and this has to do with just regular, you know, I would call it automation, right, of, of a relationship, right? If you just think about uh, how two B2B companies are interacting and selling, how do you just make those, you know, take that um, well understood, uh, process of buying, you know, discovery, you know, uh, of various stages, you know, uh, pricing, right, uh, transfer, you know, of goods, the the financial systems that are within that, quality metrics across it, re, you know, that all are need to be put in place, um, you know, need to be there. So there are those companies that are attacking B two B. And just addressing one of those, and again, it would be in a vertical, um, you know, in a vertical, uh, you know, environment. And maybe the last thing I would say is that um, I think it's useful to note that in the world of B two B, generally, right, and uh, in particular B two B e commerce, there's not new technology is not needed, right? Really, and as a result, there's very little technology risk. The technology exists already, and even more so, um, the things that make e-commerce work, 80% of it exists in B2B e-commerce already. So it's those models are out there already, the, the tech is out there. So that part is not a risk or is a challenge as much. It's about using those things, pulling them together in the right configuration, un and creating the right business rules and systems. And that usually requires someone who's steeped in the industry. You can't just come out of nowhere and try and disrupt something. In order to be successful, you're going to either have to come from one of those industries or have some knowledge of it, uh, you know, kind of prior. Um, and then utilize, you know, then have a, a tech person who's uh, capable of mixing and matching all that stuff, learning from what's been done in, in B2C. Uh, in order to kind of make things work. That helps. Yeah, one quick question, follow up on, but based on what you said. So how do you evaluate customer concentration then given what you've just said? How do, I, do, evaluate how do you customer? evaluate the customer concentration of the, the early stage companies? Because many of them have one major client and then a, a group of small ones. How do you evaluate that customer concentration given you're working in a specific niche or a specific market uh, with this, this solution? Okay. So, um, you know, if I'm thinking about how I look at any early stage company, right? Um, you know, I'm looking at what market they're playing in. And do I believe that you could grow a large company here, right? Based on how big it is and relative competition. Uh, to answer that question fully, I also need to understand what's the approach and, and, and proposed value added the company, you know, uh, says they have wants to get to, right? Does that um, solution resonate with me as something that could solve problems in that, you know, in that market for those customers, you know, and is this the team that kind of matches up with those, right? So that's a general kind of a, a, a metric. And then there are other things. Um, but to your question, uh, what I'm looking for is, so once I buy into those things and I'm saying, look, that kind of a solution, if they have it, seems like it would work. You know, some things. Now, I'm going to dig in and try and understand what is the traction telling me and telling us as a group, because honestly, this is important, just as important to you as me, 
And how far along are they? How close to some level of product market fit are they? So I would, revenue is great, right? But to me, early on at the seed stage, it's not really about the money. It's about what it, you know, about the, the fact that someone's buying something is a good indication of traction. Usage is a really good one, right? Because if something's free and, and you know, you can't get people to use it, that's telling, right? Um, or if people are paying a lot of money and hunting something, that's great. So try to understand that level of, of market fit. What value are they actually getting out of the platform versus what um, you know the claim is or the goal is to offer? So it may be you're trying to offer marketplace and people are really only looking at it for discovery. So I'm trying to understand the read the tea leaves on the usage, um, you know, and how the. So I look at that one big client and I go, okay, how is it working? Right? Does it seem like it's adding value? Are there a bunch of other ones like that out there? You know, has he has he chosen the approach of going after the middle market or the small guys? Because you kind of have to do one, right? The, 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 trying to do, you know, enterprise hundred thousand dollar contracts, kind of middle tens of thousands of dollar contracts, annual ones or hundreds or a thousand single digit thousand, totally different markets, totally different product and approach, right? So assuming you're, you're choosing one of those, I'll look at it, understand how much uh, uh, market fit I think I see there, right? Is there trajectory then to doubling, you know, and, and, and tripling that? And then I'd look backwards and say, is there evidence that that's happening? You know, what kind of a growth rate are they under, right? And if it isn't growing as much, what would need to happen in order for that to be the case? Because most likely things are going to continue as they are, uh, you know, absent some reason for it to, uh, you know, it to change. So I'd look at all those factors to try and understand what it is. So maybe just to sum up, there's that framework I use to try and understand companies, right, an opportunity. And then once I've kind of done that, I flip over to where's some evidence? What's the traction? We no longer need to argue about whether your company or what your company's doing if it's work. Let's look at what third-party validation you have. And then I spend time doing that with whatever customers you have. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Next question. Because I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. Thomas, uh, so... I've known you since, I mean, at the beginning, you used to have an office within ER Excel, Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator for years, and you learned about the accelerator process, and then you started New York Venture Partners Accelerator, which was a very successful accelerator, again, for enterprise SaaS. And you told me at the beginning, before this officially started, that you're not doing that anymore, at a time when entrepreneurship is certainly on the rise, and you can get cohorts, members from anywhere in the world, since we now live in a truly global virtual world. So what made you pivot like that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it begins with, uh, I fundamentally buy into the basis and the reason why accelerators exist, right? So I'm a fan, right? Um, I've invested in several, like you said, I, I actually backed ERA early on. And as a result, actually, you know, sat in their office and did my thing alongside them. So really got to know the model. Fundamentally, what is it at a seed stage for or a tech company, right? Uh, you need money, but you need a whole bunch of other things in order to succeed, and certainly in order to begin to accelerate your, your work. Some of that's just advice on how, how this works. You know, if there, are, if, there are, if there are 10 things you need to get you know, right in order for a company to succeed, if you're really good at the seed stage, you probably have four or five of them covered and need to figure out how to make those better and get the two or three ones you're missing. So for instance, a very common one is companies have gotten their first couple of sales through you know, personal relationship or hook and crook or sheer determination. But in order to get to series A, they're gonna to need to figure out how to do sales in a, in, a, in a scalable way, right? So almost by definition, if you're successful as a tech person building a product you know, uh, and doing that, you're probably not the person who's got great sales DNA, right? So you need that. And other times it's just much more basic. You may need some help in just navigating, you know, elements of growth and hiring and those kind of things. And and uh, the, on the flip side, um, if you've 
invested in this industry and seen a lot of startups, there's a pattern recognition. Companies encounter similar versions of exactly the same problems. Now it's not 100% the same, but it's enough. So in that environment, um, it's possible for a group of investors and former operators to add that value. And that's what an that's what an accelerator is, right? The idea is that you give up a little bit of equity for some cash in, you know, an investment, uh, and for a uh, period of intense help, usually, and then kind of alumni help after that, right? And the trade-off as a as an early stage company is I'm going to gain more by doing that than what I'm giving up, right? Which I clearly believe in because I think if you do this. You know, you should be able to raise faster and probably a higher valuation and you know whatever it is, just based on the, on the context of it. So I buy the model and I, and I believe in it. Uh, for us, it was a really great way for us to um, get out there in the market and uh, and start seeing and interacting with a lot of companies, right? Because you get to you know we did two classes a year, eight to ten companies. That gives us this great footprint, right? You know, we go from unknown to much more known because those kind of programs, you, you do a lot of more publicity to it. It played well in our market in Newark. We were trying to get people to think about this as someplace where tech happens. So our mission plus that kind of a program allowed us to get into the media and press in a way that just wouldn't have happened and isn't available really to other fir firms that are just starting. So we were on TV, right? And they like this story of we're in Newark, we're doing these things and demo days create something they can show up for, right? That and yeah, it does create a, a pipeline, a proprietary pipeline for us of companies that we want to invest in after that. But to understand that the only way that a fund that's investing in accelerator companies can really make money is they have to have capital ability to, to double down. Right. 10 companies go through the accelerator. There's going to be one, hopefully, superstar, a couple of other ones that are that are worthwhile. The rest will struggle or, or are not work. You've got to have the wherewithal to put that million dollars in after you do in order for the returns to work. What we found was that um, and we looked at how much time our team, five people who do investments, were spending on companies. It just felt unbalanced relative to the value we were getting. We were getting good companies, but we were spending a lot of time on, on companies kind of irregardless of whether they um, were, you know, we felt they were succeeding because we, we had, you know, as part of labs, made a commitment to them. And as good people, we wanted to follow through with that commitment to work with them and help them. And it's fun. And you become emotionally involved with those people. So you do. And, uh, you know, we just sort of thought, you know what? We can continue to make seed stage investments. Let's not do it programmatically or pre-seed, we'll call it 100,000-ish kind of investments, but let's focus a little bit farther upstream um, you know, on putting the 1 million and the 2 million to work you know, kind of directly into the market. It also has ramifications for fundraising because you know, we're a startup, we got to raise money. We were out raising our second fund during this transition. And the earlier you invest, the longer it takes for you to have results that you can in turn use to get it, get you know, vendors excited. And we also saw that by going pre-seed, right, you just don't have a lot of results to show, you know, potential investors uh, by the time you need to do that. So, you know, typically you, you raise money for a fund, you put money to work maybe in the first four years, you know, the latter half of the fund is follow-ons and, and exits. So at four years in for a pre-seed portfolio of accelerated companies, not much has happened, to be honest. You're not going to have any exits. So we also did this as a way to say, you know what, I think, I think if we can pull this off, we will be in a position to, uh, to uh, show greater progress, you know, when we're, you know, kind of when we're out there. Thank you. So anybody else? Next question. Abby's back. I'm back. This Abby. Traje this trajectory, um, I love that question about like accelerator shifting into what you're doing now. How did or does your personal angel investing come to play if you still do that as a VC or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, as I said before, right, um, prior to this, I was a very active individual investor. 
small family office investor, angel, basically investing my own money, right? So I was probably doing six to 10 investments a year uh, and investing in a couple of funds. So I think the main piece of that is that just taught me a shitload about how to invest in the world of seed stage companies, right? That was just great training, right? And, and before I took on the responsibility of, of investing and caretaking for other people's money, I spent, you know, you know, uh, five, seven years doing it for myself and putting my own money at risk, right? And figuring out what my, what worked and what didn't. So I think most of it, the value of it is comes from that. That and those connections through all that provide a basis by which stepping into this world of, of, of venture capital and, and investing other people's money are very valuable. That network you get out of that. Uh, that said, um, there's just not enough time in the day for me to do a great job on NVP and also be very active in my own personal investing. So since starting, I have continued to support the companies I've invested in, which means, yeah, you continue to talk to them and help them. I've done follow-on rounds there, but generally speaking, I'm not doing a lot of new investments in that, right? One, I'm just too busy. Two, there's a potential for conflict of interest, right? You know, even if it's just the appearance of conflict of interest, you know, why is he, in, why is he investing in that company and the fund did? Is he taking the good one for himself and not doing that? Uh, or if I invest in one of the companies and then they go into the fund, ooh, is he getting some, you know. Now, these are just perceived out in the West Coast. It's not uncommon in the world of venture for uh, individual partners to have a portfolio of angel investments. So there may come a time where we get more comfortable with that, uh, you know, with that uh, too. A lot of times that happens because the 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 investor think hey that's a great thing I like the founder I like the opportunity but it's too early for my fund totally so I will you'll hear about this a lot oh I, I've got insight partners to invest actually it's maybe the partner at insight who's investing and that's fine right that's that's a yeah. still means still has value uh, and maybe it will lead to a, uh, a investment from insight um, or it, it certainly confers a certain amount of, of um, justification, right, or, or, or value onto, uh, onto the company. So who's, who's raising money now or like to be raising money? And, or soon, like, you know, within the next six months. Okay. Um, aren't, aren't founders just, always raising money? Yeah, really, they are, right? You're always raising money. And, and you know, like I said before, I treat what I'm doing at New York Venture Parties as a startup. I have to raise money too, right? right. I'm constantly doing my investors and I have to answer them and I have to create, you know, my, my you know, show progress and those kind of things. So, uh, you know, I, I feel your pain, right? Um, I've also raised money for my own companies, raised money alongside, a hundred entrepreneurs, right, in a hundred different situations. Uh, and what I can tell you, you know, uh, for 99% of the time, uh, it's brain damage, right? Fundraising is just sucks the life out of you. This notion that people out West are writing some idea on a napkin and getting funded is, is an illusion, a total illusion, a delusion, right? Yeah, it probably does happen every once in a while, but who is it happening to? It's happening to people who are like third time entrepreneurs, right? Who have big exits behind them and are talking to the same VCs that backed them before. And it's the kind of investor who's just willing to kind of toss money over at the fence for a big idea. That's just not helpful to think about that, right? As an entrepreneur, because that's not what's gonna happen. You're gonna have to battle for your money, right? Um, and, uh, I would suggest that um, it's that kind of an approach that's going to allow you to win, right? You know, think about it as it's a campaign, at least, um, you know, where you've got to put together a whole bunch of things, gather advice and get out there, and it's going to consume your lifeblood for a period of time. Uh, so the first rule is if you don't have to uh, fundraise, don't, right? And if you, especially if you believe that um, in the next, name the period, month, quarter, you're going to have more traction data points 
people, whatever it is, that would make you look better in the eyes of an investor. If the trade-off is, hey, wait another month and then I'll have this new client on, um, and that having that one client on is going to make you know, I'm going to look very different to investors, then that's a strong argument to wait. That said, good ventures, and we all believe we have a good venture. They do con- they, by, by their very definition, they consume capital and grow faster. So there's the, the, obviously that trade-off, but it's not costless. It requires a lot of time. So taking a, a concerted approach to how you go through that, um, how you build your deck how you create a, I'll call it investor funnel, right? And mine that funnel, right? And then continue to learn from it and go back out. Um, You know, that's uh, uh, important. And what I would say is you can waste a lot of time fundraising um, where if you're talking to, you know, this is sort of, you know, Tom's insight number 26, Talk to investors that have fit to your startup, right? If they've never invested in a e-commerce company before, the likelihood that you're going to be the first one they invest in is just low, right? It doesn't matter for seed investors when they have money, if they haven't invested in what you're doing, you know. And the reverse is really the true one. The more fit they have, the better likelihood that they'll be your lead investor, your first investor, which is often what you're looking for. So it's, I think it's valuable to think about what's the perfect investor. What does that profile of the perfect investor look like? Probably not going to find them, but if you understand what that profile looks like, you'll be much more tuned to seeing investors and saying, yeah, he's got a lot of fit. He rings the bell on two or three things. So what would it be? It would be understands your industry, meaning, you know, been there and done that, knows your client base really well, maybe not your, not your approach, ha- has done your model before marketplace, say, right? Or B2B or B2C e-commerce, that kind of thing. Um, and is an active investor, meaning they've invested before, right? Um, so that they're smart and you're not trying to teach them how to, you know, uh, so fit, think a lot about fit. And if some investor doesn't have fit, it, it, you just got to deprioritize it, right? Because it's, you know, and fit can also mean what stage you're at, right? They can be perfect on all those other ones, but if they if they only invest in Series A and you're just not at that stage, that's not going to yield that money you need. It's a relationship you might want to build on, but if you're focused on fundraising, it's just not a good use of time um, unless you're learning something from that's very valuable. So staying focused on investors that have fit to what you're doing is a is a strong uh, uh, rule. Uh, to reducing at least some of the brain damage of uh, fundraising. I love that you call it brain damage. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because it's hard. I mean, anyone who's done it, it's like, you know, it just sucks the life out of you. And, and, and it's, it, it, it's easy to say there's nothing valuable about it to moving your company forward. Right? It's distracting you, in fact, from doing something right for it. The reality is it actually does train you in some things that are very valuable, um, but it's hard to see that when you're doing it. It helps you clarify how you speak about your company and, and pitch it to people because you're not just pitching to investors. It helps you refine key elements of your model. It'll put someone will ask questions and that will push you to think about these things. And that's not just about raising money, that's about what you do, right? So there is value, but you know, proportional value, no, right? Um, so, and, uh, you know, it sucks the life out of you. It's life draining, right? And for all sorts of different reasons, you know? And uh, maybe another perspective to take, um, and I rattle on for this because at one, at one point in my career, maybe three or four years ago, I used to teach a class at, at General Assembly on fundraising. And I started out as a 45 minute class, and then I did, you know, a 90 minute class. And then it eventually turned into a two and a half hour class that would always go over. Um, and uh, we walked through kind of my sense, you know, a lot of these things that we talked about, but, but many, many more. And one of the important things to understand is what is the continuum of investors, types of people who will give you money, right? And uh, I'll, I'll talk about it real briefly and, and maybe give one example of why it's important. But on this side, I would have, it's like you, 
investing your own time and money, maybe first, friends and family, you know, and, th and this is people you already know. No one new here, but you already know who trust you in some fashion. May or may not have any experience in, in you know, in your market and what you're doing, may or may not be, most of the time not, be a skilled venture investor, right? an angel investor, right? But they trust you. And that's a big thing and it allows them to move forward. Upstream from that are angels of various calibers and, and you know, maybe up a little, you know, overlapping in that or angel groups, you know, um, which function a little differently. Super angels, you know, it's called that someone who, you know, has at least 20, you know, up to 100 maybe investments, right? Someone who's done a lot, they kind of stick there. Upstream from that are the first funds that are out there. And there are uh, funds that invest, you know, on the lower side, uh, $100,000, right? Everything before that is probably individual investors doing, for the most part, checks in the tens of thousands or maybe a hundred, right? And it's, Upstream from that is people putting lower 100, 100 200, 250, 250 thousand dollar checks into a round, uh, you know, and then upstream from that are kind of early stage seed funds, right? Maybe their their check is 450, 400, you know, into a one million dollar round. There's another set of people that are up there, kind of at a million. We're in that million to two million range. You can draw those lines whatever you want. You can call them seed, pre-seed, series A, and that keeps switching, but there is a continuum there. The bright lines there are between friends and family and angels, because you're talking about people you know to people you're just meeting and who have experience investing in companies. They're gonna bring a different framework that's more rigorous. They model on the best practices of what venture, what venture investors do. So they will ask these questions and they will hold you to a standard that your friends and family just won't. There's a bright line there. The next bright line is between angels and funds, right? You know, you got to think about the profile of an angel investor as an individual usually, right? The, or, um, you know, that uh, was successful in their life, which puts them in a position to be able to throw money at these things. Uh, and they're doing this part-time. They're doing it on the side. There are no resources. They don't have a staff, right? That kind of stuff. Uh, and they're, you know, they're also going to California and going on vacations, and you know, they're 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 eccentric in what they do. Um, you know, they don't they don't they don't run it like a business for the most part, right? But they can be very valuable, and they have capital. Once you step from that world to funds, there's much more of a traditional structure there. It looks a little different across across the team, and, but these are people who are in the business. Of putting money to work, right? And creating returns. And therefore, they're much more process driven. They're, they're, if they're really good, they're much more specific about what they're doing. Um, you know, uh, have to try and manage their time really effectively, you know. Um, so, are just going to act. They're going to have somebody supports them, right? Generally, they're just more professional about kind of following through. Not everyone, but those are the bright lines I put in there as you're thinking about early stage capital. But we're depending upon where you are, you will be, you know, what stage of this that will be open to you will change. And your own connections and past investors will define kind of what the most likely window of potential investors is as your traction and, and other elements of your, of your company um, uh, evolve and grow. And uh, knowing your customer, your proto customer, right? Because pitching is sales. If you were going to try and sell to, you know, your target client, you know, say it was you work with manufacturing companies to sell them software. Before you went to that sales meeting, you would understand. You would, you're, you're there because you, this company fits a category of sales. You know something about them. You've done some research. You put yourself in the head of that person, and that makes you more effective at selling. The same can be done for investors and to generally just understand the quirks of angels and how they operate and you know, other elements of this, super important, right? Because pitching is selling. Selling done well involves knowing your, you know, knowing your target. You know, I just wanted to add something. <clears throat> people always, people sometimes wonder why investors look for a team. 
you know, what's wrong with the solo founder? And I realized it's not just because, yes, they, they often say, well, we want to know that there's somebody else who buys into your idea. I think it's because one has to run the company and the other has to spend their time fundraising. <laughs> That's why you need at least two. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons. And you've caught, you know, you mentioned two of them that are absolutely true, right? There, um, I would say for me, it begins with, you know, especially in the B2B world, you need to have the business knowledge, the experience in the domain in which you're operating, which typically means you came from that industry or spent a lot of time in it or know the customer base of it really well so that you're able to make judgments about the product and what goes out there and be able to speak the language, you know, and, and probably have some, you know, potential early customers. And the other side, you need, you know, a, a, a tech, you need technical skill. And, and the closer that is to a extremely talented tech founder that can build software and turn it over every night and every week and iterate on it, right? Those things, you know, one absolutely needs to be there. Um, and two, the, the closer it is to that kind of pairing, um, the better. Sometimes that's the same person. Sometimes you find early founders who really are doing both. Ultimately, they're gonna to need to build a team, right? But they can, but to me, it's those two skill sets that are absolutely important. And yeah, you know, if you're, you know, it's helpful if, if you need to raise money that there can still be progress on the product and selling and whatever. So yeah, there's an advantage, obviously, just in headcount having two co-founder or you know two co-founders, or maybe three or at least at the beginning founders plus a couple of people. Uh, you know, often the case if you're that business solo founder, right? All these things are, are the issue you probably had to leverage outsource tech development. And it's really difficult to make the transition between that and um, in-house tech, which you just absolutely need in order, to, in order to compete with all the other people that are out there. You could start that way, it's hard, but you're even if you did it well, you're gonna need to you know, find that engineer, find that you know, co-founder or CTO. Uh, so yeah, we, we you know, I, I violated that rule and regretted it multiple times. Um, you know, full of founders. The worst is the, the worst is boyfriend girlfriend. Oh, never do that. What about yeah. husband wife? Some most of the time they don't tell you either up front, right? Uh, but I, I, I it's, that's that's just disastrous. Married couple, I've seen that work. It does work. You don't get those same things. But um, anyway, you you were saying something, Abby. Oh, I was going to also, I think, you know, my just, it's apologies, Abby, that I found a lot of investor pushback from brother, sister, which I don't understand because these people have known each other their entire lives. Yeah. I mean, anytime there's a familiar relationship in there, you know, just, you kind of wonder like, you know, are, are, did they choose each other because it really is the right mix of skills or did they, was it convenient and kind of just there because of trust? I don't have a problem with brother sister. I would look at the relationship, make sure it's not one where they're fighting. You know, you can certainly know families and siblings that, you know, where that's a problem. Um, yeah, and, and obviously it's commitment to it so that someone doesn't flake, right? You know. Um. Oh, Abby, I interrupted you. I apologize. Oh, not at all. And mine was actually a really brief question. I, I have a question about board seats. I, we had a conversation um, with someone who um, potentially could add value to the um, business in some way, partially in the form of some uh, venture relationships that they have. Um, and he started to talk about board seats. And I feel that we're too early. We're pre-seed. We have like a nice list of advisors with their personal relationships of folks that we've worked with in the past. Um, they didn't take a board seat. Um, I would normally consider that a negotiating chip for an equity stage, you know, like a series A. Um, I don't know if people have experience or advice regarding that. So what I would say is that um, if an early stage investor, irregardless of whether it's a note or a priced round, is putting, you know, significant money at that stage, right? So and significant means different things, but say, you're raising 750 and they put in 400, right? Um, and hopefully you're taking them on as an investor because you think they're value added. That could be the appropriate time. They may ask at that point to, you know, you, time for you to create a board. 
because it's just, it's, it's how this is done. Get ahead of the curve because you're certainly gonna need one down the road. It will likely be a three person board, you, your co-founder and them. You will ultimately have control other than maybe a few kind of, you know, things that are written into the, into the documents. As that dollar number goes up, again, it doesn't matter if series A or whatever, it, it is very reasonable for someone who's putting a million dollars into a, um, you know, into a startup uh, as a good investor to want to be, uh, take a board seat. Sometimes they don't though. I, you know, board is a lot of work. I often hedge and become a board observer. So I'm not, you know, more, but I get that exposure and that ability to do it. So I wouldn't be afraid of it. It's more about making sure that you choose the right person, right? Um, or at least a good person, um, you know, and, and at a very minimum, if they're not going to be negative, <laughs> you know, as an advisor or someone who you're interacting with, this, that's not usually the case, but it sometimes can be. Does that answer your question? Well, we, well we're only at the stage of raising about 500000 in pre-seed. Um, so my guess is, I mean, we're not necessarily at the stage of talking dollars. Yes. We're just kind of talking about how yes, they I, work. But say, my guess is that say, you probably don't need it. What you need is good advisors. So it's advisory work should be fine. And anyone who's investing at that stage should be okay with that. Okay. Right? And if they're not, you sort of wonder how well do they know the industry? How well do they know what they're doing? Is there something about the way that they operate that they, they want to have a higher level of control or do they like the formality of being a board member? You know, is there is the services, there's some sign in there about why, right? Mm -hmm. think about the right answer is, you know, you may not actually get to ask this, why? That, what, how would that be? If the goal is we want to do everything that's helpful to make this company succeed, what's the best thing to do, right? Right? And it, most of the time early on, being on the board doesn't add any more value than just being a good advisor. And you know, and it adds complexity and other things. But and then I, I do would, they go ahead? Oh, do you generally look for those? Are those um, the? Do we have to set up like some separate documentation for the board as well? I just haven't done my research in that area. Yeah, or is it well, part of their term sheet? Yeah. So I mean, one. Are you an LLC or are you a C corp? We're, we'll have to move to become a C corp. But we're right now. Yeah. We're so if you're an LLC and the structure, there's no such thing as a board. Right. There's something that sort of serves like it and, you know, managing members and that sort of thing. But if you are a corporation, you kind of must have a board that just your Delaware C Corp. That's just what it is. Early on, that can be informal. It's basically just you, if you're a solo founder or you and your, you know, your co-founder or you, your co-founder and an early friend, family person. And you don't have, you know, have board meetings at all, but it exists. So that's usually how most people get into it because you just kind of have to have something in there in order to um, follow the rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be afraid of it. You know, it's, it's, it needs to be set up in a way that is value added. Thank you. So we have time for maybe one more question. Does anybody one, more, one more question. I have a question whose name isn't Abby. Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to hop in. Go ahead, Adrian. <laughs> um, yeah, Tom, I'd love to to hear your thesis or the way you think about the creator economy and sort of the that trend. Um, obviously, kind of a buzzword these days. But um, how do you look at it? Is that a space that you're interested in? And where do you think there might be opportunities there? Okay. Um, so uh, I think there's. I love the creator economy. I've been involved in some startups that I would say are rather that, that, that feed that trend as I define it, you know. Um, it fits often this marketplace model of where you have uh, a lot of these individual creators. That's kind of how I would define a creator. It's not a company, it's an individual or a very small, you know, sense sole proprietor or whatever uh, that could be, you know, could be a freelancer doing design or tech, could also be someone who makes things on Etsy, could be lots of things. But I think about it as that kind of, you know, um, 1099 individual, you know, sole proprietors person who's doing those kind of things and doing something creative driven, right? That's become possible because of these platforms that allow them to find customers and do things. So now they, it can exist or it has blown up because there is a way for people who do that to make a living, 
right? Um, that didn't exist certainly 20 years ago in a lot of ways. So that's kind of why it's happening, I would say. And there's a lot of people out there where that lifestyle um, is, um, and that kind of uh, job is really attractive or fits the environment. You know, given all the disruption of people getting thrown out of jobs and the economy going this way and this way, there's a certain advantage to kind of, hey, I'm just, I'm gonna do it, I'll do it myself. I don't need to involve a lot of other people. Um, and uh, have a lot of overhead. Good. So uh, I see those powerful trends around there. So, um, you know, and, and stop, and again, stop me if this is, isn't exactly where you were headed with this. So if that's the person, you know, if, you, if you're excited about that economy, you know, the question I ask is, all right, um, what would make that worker or that kind of person, you know, make their uh, business or the business surrounding it function better, right? And a lot of what you see in startups around there is someone proposing or building a platform that aggregates people together, helps them with a set of tools that make their life easier, supports them, you know, in some other way, maybe highly vertical, maybe horizontal, you know, um, so that uh, looks to facilitate the growth of that market and through the success of those individual creatives creates a successful, you know, platform. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think, I think it, it, it does. Um, I, I share that, um, that sort of uh, vision or on, on the opportunity and, and how the market is evolving. Um, uh, I'm curious to whether you guys are, are interested in investing in that space or does that not fit your, sort of B2B uh, definition or thesis? It wouldn't rule it out. Um, my own past investment history and bias would be to be a little cautious there, just based on kind of prior attempts I've seen and been involved with, because uh, it's a very passionate group. People who want to serve it and build things in it are passionate about it, and very, but very frequently, um, uh, the, the, the rationale, the business rationale for some, you know, proposed idea, uh, has more passion than, than actual potential in it. Again, that's generic though. I don't know your startup or whatever, uh, or, um, it's something like the following. In fact, I'm going to hop off right now. My, my next meeting is with an entrepreneur who is creating a, a neo bank you know, um, essentially, uh, you know, so a company that provides financial services and financial support, but vertically targeted to architects, engineers, and creatives, right? So I look at that and I go, ah, oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. You hadn't heard of that before. Um, if I think about the world of banking, right? It's, you know, it's continually being disrupted and there, there's certainly a wave of that going on. I know of another bank that does this that succeeded. Silicon Valley Bank is the bank that sort of focused on venture and us, built their products around that, built their brand around that. And they've actually been pretty damn successful. It also gives them access to putting equity to work. So there's an idea where it's it's focused on serving you know, elements of the creative economy, but it's you know, it's it's a fintech or you know, neo bank kind of a, a thing. So, yeah, I see good ideas there. My bar is just probably a little higher. In that in that area, but yeah. Anyway. yeah, thanks. That no, that that's super helpful. So anyway, so just to finish off, I put my uh, my email details in the chat. Um, I'm just tw my initials at newark.vc. Uh, my suggestion would be um, if you think you're kind of in my range or in my you know sort of uh, I fit to what you're doing, um, send me a blurb. About what you're doing, tell me approximately sort of where you are and attach a deck, whatever deck you have, and, and I'll take a look at it. And if it resonates with me, maybe it's something to work on. If not, I'll try and provide some sort of some at least some, some kind of a, a response. Uh, and if you see things that are out there as entrepreneurs that do fit as a fellow entrepreneur, you know, feel free to to you know share my email and, and suggest that they uh, that they reach out. So question, do you read cold emails or should they reference the breakfast? 
um, it's always better to reference something. And that'll also help me remind or remind me that I've met, you know, Tripp and Scott and, you know, Manif before, right? So yeah, it can't hurt. Obviously, as a general rule, warm introductions are always better, right? But this is warm enough. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so that's what I got for you guys. Uh, good luck with everything. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to uh, uh, interact over the life cycle of uh, your company and, and my, uh, my fund and my investing. So, and thank, thank you, you so much, Thomas. We really appreciate it. And it's funny because uh, you don't, a lot of you have never met Tom. He's about eight feet tall and I'm about three feet tall. So it's usually very funny when we're when uh, we're hosting in person. So it's nice to be at eye level. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you, Bonnie, uh, for this and for everything you do. If it's not obvious to people on this call, or generally, Bonnie is super well connected in the industry. He's been doing this forever. It's been an institution here. So uh, you know, uh, I've loved working with her and always help always get her help on any event that I'm uh, I'm doing. So you're in good hands uh, doing this. Uh, and you should look for great people out there to help you, right? So just peak pitch. Do it again. Yes, I don't think you guys have been to peak pitch, but that's something that I've done ski based off site in February. 100 entrepreneurs, 50 investors, um, pitch people on the chairlift going up. Uh, I love the event. It's just a lot of work. So didn't have it last year for obvious reasons. We'll hopefully have it back this year and uh, another opportunity for us to spend time together. All right, cool. Gotta go. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.